Thanks for asking me to talk about radiotherapy for treating Dupuytrons and Lederhose disease. Um, this is a webinar that is mainly aimed towards patients, but of course it might be of interest to medical, medical professionals and professionals as well. Um, just to take you through my experience um, using radiotherapy for Dupuytrons and Lederhose disease, um, I was appointed as a consultant oncologist in the Royal Surrey County Hospital in Guildford in the UK in 2010. And I started uh, the Dupuytrons practice website um, a year later in order to offer people the option of getting radiotherapy for Dupuytrons disease because it wasn't widely available, particularly at that time. Um, I've also been a specialist advisor on patient internet forums. I was on the Royal College of Radiologists Review Committee and we wrote a document in 2015 reviewing the use of radiotherapy for benign conditions, including Dupuytrons and Lederhose. Um, I've uh, also been on NICE committee for this. Um, I presented at the British Society of Surgery to the Hand meeting on a panel presentation. And I run a clinic weekly um, treating patients with Dupuytrons and Lederhose disease with radiotherapy, but also other benign conditions, including plantar fasciitis and cuboid scarring. Um, currently, I'm the UK lead for Genesis Care, which is a national and international private cancer care company um, for benign radiotherapy and also skin radiotherapy. And I've probably treated around a thousand patients with radiotherapy for Dupuytrons and Lederhose disease. So most radiotherapy in the UK is used as a high dose treatment for treating cancer. Basically, it stops cancers growing. We tend to use around 60 gray, with gray being the unit of uh, radiation uh, that's given. But also, radiotherapy can be used for many non-cancer conditions. Um, and that's because, first of all, it's anti-proliferative. In other words, it stops stuff growing. And also, it's an anti-inflammatory treatment as well. We tend to use much lower doses than for cancer. So anywhere between 3 and 30 gray would be the normal sort of doses more towards the 30 gray for Dupuytrons and Lederhose. And therefore toxicity and side effects, although we can get some side effects, they don't tend to be a major issue um, with these doses of radiotherapy. So I'm gonna to talk today about Dupuytrons disease of the hands and Lederhose disease of the foot. Um, so who gets Dupuytrons and Lederhose? Well, there is a genetic predisposition, and um, particularly there's um, certain uh, families have it more um, and perhaps people from Northern Europe get it and perhaps males more than females. Um, that seems to be true but I must say that I tend to see um, equal females and males in my practice. There's a wide range of people that, um, that get it in terms of their age. So the average onset for patients with Dupuytrons tends to be in their 50s or 60s but I've seen people anywhere from their 20s to their 80s. Um, it tends to be about 10 years earlier in Lederhose, so it's a little bit more common to see people in their 20s and 30s with Lederhose. Um, Dupuytrons disease is actually very common. So um, we think perhaps approximately 2% of the UK population, um, and that's obviously a lot of people in the UK, given there are 60, 60 million people in the UK. Lederhose disease is rarer than Dupuytrons disease and tends to coexist in about 25% of patients. There are some conditions which are associated with Dupuytrons and Lederhose. So Peyronie's disease is a very similar condition where you get a plaque that in the penis that is um, painful and can cause bending. Um, that is uh, an actual uh, identical condition if you look under the microscope. There's a condition called Garrod's pads, which are on the back of the hands, you um, get them on the knuckles. And again, if you looked under the microscope, they're actually the same as Dupuytrons and Lederhose. And also frozen shoulder is associated with these conditions. Other associations, as some people do have a family history, um, it's not necessary to have a family history. And sometimes, even though um, there might be a genetic component, it can actually miss out generations. So just because your parents or grandparents haven't got it, doesn't mean that there isn't a genetic uh, element to this. People who have diabetes are more likely to get it. People who do manual labour and particularly vibrational labour um, and uh, that's actually uh, pretty well proven and something that people can claim for occupationally. Um, hand trauma, so particularly if you have trauma, uh, for instance surgery or you break your wrist, 
but also blunt trauma. So for instance, mountain climbers tend to get dupatrons more than uh, non-mountain climbers. Um, smoking is associated with this. Alcohol excess is a little controversial, but certainly having liver disease, in particular cirrhosis of the liver, is associated. And then there are also certain drugs and medicines uh, that uh, can worsen this. So let's talk about Dupuytren's disease to start with. What is Dupuytren's disease? Dupuytren's disease is a benign thickening of the palmar fascia leading to fixed bending or contracture of the fingers. So you can see in the picture here that this is a nodule starting the palm, and then that then becomes um, a cord. So in other words, a linear thing that goes up to a finger and also a cord that comes uh, down the other way towards the wrist. That's an early cord. And then eventually that cord contracts and forms this fixed bending of the finger, which is what we call a contract. So biologically, we could divide it into two phases. There's an early phase where there's a lot of action going on. So the fibroblasts that put down the uh, scar tissue uh, proliferate. In other words, there are more of them, they're dividing. Um, and there's an in inflammation component. Um, and that's where the nodules and the cores develop and you get this skin pitting or skin retraction. So that is a phase where there's a lot going on and therefore treatments uh, such as radiotherapy may well be effective in that phase. However, in the late phase, where you actually see the contracture of the finger, that is actually less biologically active. And what happens, we think, is the fibroblasts that give down the uh, scarring turn into what we call myofibroblasts. And myo means muscle. And these fibroblasts basically are able to contract and that uh, forms the contracture. There are other theories of how this works, but that's one of those uh, theories. So in this late phase, we think perhaps radiotherapy is not effective because it's less biologically active. So let's uh, look at some pictures, which I got from the internet, um, of different stages of Dupuytren's disease. So you might be able to see there's a small nodule here. There's a cord, a proximal cord, in other words, going towards the wrist. There's a distal cord where the skin is being uh, held down. And then you can see on either side, this sort of Y shape is actually normal skin that's sort of tented up because it's being pulled by this. Then you can see a little bit more, bit more advanced that there's skin pitting over here, what we call skin retraction. And there's a bit more disease over there and some obvious cords going to the fingers. This is a picture of Garrod's pad. So it's a very, very large one, probably the largest one I've seen. Um, and these can cause some problems, particularly with uh, making a fist, and they can become quite tender and they can catch on things. This is a little bit more advanced with some palmar disease, and you can see now that the finger is not able to fully straighten. Um, and so that's a fairly early contracture, perhaps of 20 or 30 degrees. And this is clearly a very advanced case where someone's got cords and uh, very advanced contractures in a number of their fingers. So, the normal test that people use is called the tabletop test. So if you've got a contracture of a finger and you put your hand down on a table, you won't be able to flatten it. And you can see that over here. But there's actually an early test that I use where this is my hand and I'm lifting my index finger here. And that's called hyperextension. In other words, I'm able to get it past the midline. Now that hyperextension, before there's a contracture, that hyperextension reduces. And you can see that I can bend my finger back less. And then eventually I can't bend it um, at all backwards. Now, this person would not fail the tabletop test because they don't have a frank contracture, but they do already have loss of hyperextension, and that is really on the way to forming a contracture. So I think that's an important test that I tend to do. Um, this is a bit medical, but we do classify Dupuytren's disease into various stages. Stage N is the earliest stage. And that's where we have nodules, cords, and skin retraction, but no contracture. The next stage, stage N1, is where there are nodules, cords, and skin retraction, and a very, very minor degree of flexion deformity or contracture, up to five or 10 degrees, so very, very minor. And then the other stages is where there's more severe contractures. So traditionally, your GP or hand surgeon, when you have nodules, cords, and a very minor contracture, would say, look, there's nothing to do you don't need any surgery, just watch and wait. And then at a later date, they would say, ah, you've now got to 20 or 30 degrees, there's a problem with your fingers and your hands, so let's do either surgery or perhaps a needle, or there used to be an enzyme which we could use, and let's release that contracture so that you can get your hand back to normal. So that's what they used to say. In fact, 
what I'm going to talk about is that at this early stage, we can perhaps intervene with radiotherapy for some patients and uh, prevent them getting to that later stage. So let's look at some evidence. I'm not going to go into too much detail. Um, there's a professor called uh, Professor Siegenschmidt in Germany who did a trial. Um, and this is for patients with early Duperchance disease. And what I mean by that is that um, they either don't have a contracture at all, or they have a very early contracture. So going back to the staging before, that would be stage N or stage N1. These are also patients where they have progression. What do I mean by that? There are some patients that get a nodule and it stays like that for 10 years. Those patients don't need treatment. However, there are patients, quite a lot of patients, who get a nodule and then another one, and then the nodules get bigger and they get a cord and it starts pulling on their fingers. Those are patients that I would say are progressing. In other words, their disease is worsening. And those are patients really that should be considering further treatment. So Professor Siegenschmidt compared two different doses um, and we'll go through this in a little bit of detail. Um, 30 gray, so remember gray is a radiation uh, measure. So 30 gray against 21 gray. So comparing those two doses. All patients have progressive disease and they were offered either radiotherapy with one of those two doses or a watch and wait. And those were the control, but the watch and wait group were not randomized to the watch and wait group. And therefore there was not a randomized controlled study. So this study, although it's very interesting and useful and definitely guides people's practice, is a little bit flawed. Um, so I think this is probably one of the explanations for why this hasn't been funded by the NHS or other public health systems in a wide basis. Um, so it's a little unfortunate that the study was done in this way, but this is still in my view good evidence um, and uh, certainly guides our practice. Um, he followed these patients up for eight and a half years, so quite a long follow-up. There are later follow-ups, but I'm just going to tell you these figures. They're sort of the most straightforward ones to talk about. So this is the way he gave the treatment. So 15 gray and five fractions. A, fi a fraction is a treatment, um, and a treatment's given uh, every weekday. So five treatments would be given Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, in other words, over one week. 15 gray and five fractions means that each fraction was three gray. So it's three gray every weekday for one week. Um, there was then a gap of, at that time, around two months, although we tend to give three months these days. Um, that gap is variable. And to be honest, there's no real evidence showing that a longer or a shorter gap is better or worse. But I would say that at least two months gap is probably the standard at this point. Um, so I tend to say two to four months gap is very, very standard. After the gap, um, the patients were given 15 gray and five fractions over one week. Um, and that's a total of 30 gray and 10 fractions. If you remember, they compared 30 gray with 21 gray 21 gray turned out not to be as good, so I'm not really going to cover that in great detail at this point. Although it is an alternative way we can do things and still get reasonable results. So this is the standard treatment that I use and most people use. So just to show you what sort of machines we can use, um, basically there are two main types of radiotherapy machines that we use. Um, one is called a superficial or orthovoltage machine. Um, and it's a low energy x-ray machine and uh, this is a machine um, that, we, that we used um, for skin cancer or for Dupuytrons or lectures. Very, very straightforward, very simple, um, advantages and disadvantages to it, but it works very well. We can also use this very complex machine called a linear accelerator. Um, this tends to be the big machines that you get in cancer centres, and it's really designed to treat very, very complex things deep in the body. But it can also be used in a particular mode which delivers electron treatment. And that is a good way of treating um, the surface and just underneath the surface of the skin. So either superficial orthovoltage treatment, in other words, low voltage x-rays or electrons, either of those are fine. So I wouldn't worry about if you're going to be offered one or the other, they're both fine and they both work equally well and their side effects are very, very similar. So this is the results that Siegenschmidt saw at eight and a half years of follow-up. So I'll just take you through these. Um, 
In terms of the progression, in other words, worsening of the disease at eight and a half years, those who did not receive radiotherapy, 62% of them got worse. Those who did receive radiotherapy with vertebrae, only 20% of those got worse. So in other words, the worsening of the disease was reduced by about three times by eight and a half years. Now, those who needed surgery for a contracture, 30% um, who were not treated with radiotherapy needed surgery for a contracture, and that was reduced to 8% by radiotherapy. Now, there are a few messages here. The most obvious message is radiotherapy reduces by about three times the risk of progression and the risk of needing surgery for a contracture. But the two other messages are, if you see that actually 38% of patients actually didn't get worse, even though they didn't have treatment. So there are a small number of people, or about one in three, who actually the disease will stabilize and therefore actually don't necessarily need treatment. The problem is we have no idea how to work out who those patients are. So that's just an important message. The last message here really is that despite radiotherapy still, one in five people still progress and one in 12 people still need surgery for a contracture. So this is not a miracle cure. The other thing I will say is that radiotherapy, while it looks like it's very effective in stopping progression and forming a contracture, um, it doesn't make the disease melt away. I would say probably between 50 and 70% of my patients say that the disease has got less tender, um, the nodules have softened a little, and perhaps they've got a little smaller. But that is by no means um, everyone. And I think the primary reason why we're delivering the radiotherapy is really to stop it worsening and getting contracture rather than just uh, to reduce the size of the nodules. So what sort of side effects? Well, acute means uh, immediately during and immediately after the radiotherapy. And people do get a little bit of redness and dryness of the skin. It, grade one means pretty mild. Um, and so it tends to be a little bit like sunburn. So you might notice that the skin gets a little bit red and sore. Um, it doesn't tend to be a major issue. Sometimes about, I would say, more than 25% of people in my experience do get dryness of the skin. And I just tell them to put a simple moisturizer on there. For instance, E45, that sort of thing. Most people find that that dryness will go, but about 15 or 20% find they have ongoing dryness in the long term for which they need to put moisturizer on. Sometimes people in the long term also say, you know, my skin feels a little bit rougher or smoother or thinner or thicker, or sometimes even the color of the skin's a little bit different. Those tend to be minor changes, but that's certainly something I've heard from a lot of patients. The other thing I will say is about one or 2% of people um, do get um, more severe side effects after the radiotherapy. So for instance, you get more severe redness um, or sometimes some blistering or, or even that the skin can break down. I've got to say, I've seen that perhaps um, in two cases in the last sort of eight years in my practice. And those were both people where there was a good reason. For instance, a builder who was lifting heavy con concrete sheets or someone who went sailing where the ropes were going through their hands, those sort of things where they were putting a lot of stress on their skin. The last really important thing to talk about is that obviously radiotherapy is used in very high doses to treat cancer but radiation also has the risk of causing cancer. Now, we've estimated that risk at about one in 5,000 risk for a 50-year-old man. Um, and the average period between the radiotherapy and getting a mild skin cancer in that region is around 20 or 30 years. So obviously, that is very important if you're treating someone who's young. So if I'm treating someone who's, let's say, in their 30s, then that conversation is a much more important conversation to have in depth. And I would tend to quote a higher risk. So for someone who's, let's say, in their 20s or 30s, I might say it's between a 0.1 and a 1% lifetime risk. Um, and for someone who's, let's say, over 60 or 70, I, I would really say it's important that you know that there is a risk, but it, it's so small that it's actually difficult to measure. So that risk is, is um, very personalized particularly according to age, but perhaps also according to other risk factors as well. So these are some um, quotes that I have from some of my patients just to, to let you know. Um, so I wasn't willing to just wait and see and risk ending up with hands like my dad. So often I get patients who have a family history 
and they're worried that their hands uh, will need surgery and often they come and see me to try and prevent that with radiotherapy. As far as I could see, I had everything to gain and nothing to lose. I think that was a very kind comment. I think it's important to know that there are potential side effects um, and obviously you need to make uh, visits and so on. But I, I think I would tend to say that for some people, there is a lot to gain and little to lose. Um, one of my patients described it in more detail and said it was painless and unspectacular um, and he had some temporary mild reddening. Several months on a noticeable softening of my Dupuytron's disease, I've done all I can to give myself a chance of negating the disease process. Now the last patient here is I truly believe radiotherapy has allowed me to enjoy my life to the full and without pain. This is a patient who did have pain in the nodules. Um, to me that is just wonderful. So for some patients, this really can be um, very good for their quality of life and obviously for anxiety about what's going to happen in the future. So let's go back to that pathway. And I would say that uh, from my point of view, the modern rate Dupuytron's pathway would be in the early stage where you have nodules cause and skin retraction um, and either no contracture or up to 10 degrees contracture, that radiotherapy would be at least worth considering. Obviously, for patients who have a high degree of contracture, um, then surgery or needle aponeurotomy are ways of releasing that contracture. And radiotherapy doesn't really have a role in the more advanced stages. So just to go over that, these are patients um, that I would consider treating for radiotherapy. So early Dupuytren's disease, obviously have to have signs of Dupuytren's disease, no contracture or early uh, contracture up to 10 degrees. And I tend to say progression in the last six to 12 months. So just so that you know that if you progressed, let's say five years ago, I wouldn't necessarily count that as progression if there's not been recent progression. Let's go on to talking about Lederhose disease. So clinically, this is um, a disease where you get lumps in the arch of the feet. When I say they may be asymptomatic, what I mean is sometimes people get these lumps, they're relatively small, they don't cause pain or discomfort, and really my advice is you do not necessarily need to do anything about them at all. And in fact, um, leaving them alone is probably the best thing you can do. However, sometimes these nodules can grow and cause problems. And sometimes they can also become tender. So people can get pain on standing, walking, running, and sometimes even pain at rest. Um, it is rare to get stiffening and contracture of the toes, like in the hands. Um, and perhaps that's because because we put uh, weight on our foot all day, that sort of keeps uh, the toes from contracting, whereas obviously our hands tend to be like this in this position, when, particularly when you sleep. But like with Dupuytren's disease, sometimes these things can settle down themselves and sometimes they can get worse. So there is variation in how um, people's disease uh, progresses. And sometimes, as I say, it can just settle. Most of the time, the disease is pretty typical and it can be diagnosed just by an experienced person looking at your hands and feet. But occasionally, particularly if um, someone has a single nodule in the sole of one foot and no other disease elsewhere, then I will tend to do an investigation, either an ultrasound or, a, or an MRI of fine, just to rule out other different diagnoses. So a lot of patients can be dealt with conservatively, in other words, not really needing medical treatment as such. Um, so avoiding direct pressure is the main thing. Obviously, when you put pressure on these nodules, they can become tender. Um, and there are various ways of doing that, um, either soft inner soles. Sometimes you can get custom orthotics, so you can get sort of vacuum-made orthotics that really conform very exactly to the size of the nodules. They can be very helpful, although sometimes when the nodules grow, again, you know, you, you have to stop using them. Um, people sometimes use padding as well. I mean, the idea really is to take as much pressure off the nodule as possible. Uh, sometimes people find stretching helpful. I must say, sometimes people say that actually makes them more tender, so different people find different things. There isn't really a standard medical treatment. Um, sometimes people have steroid injections, but I've got to say the reports have been that people find them quite painful, but they don't tend to be terribly effective, particularly in the long term. So often what happens is people go to their GP, their GP isn't necessarily so familiar with this condition and they send them to a surgeon and if they cut it out, which um, these days luckily surgeons don't tend to do, they, they virtually always come back. 
and they can actually come back bigger, more painful and associated with scar tissue. So one of the really important messages here is don't get these cut out um, because it may well become worse rather than better. There is quite a large operation called a radical plantar fasciectomy where basically they take away the whole of the fascia from the bottom of the foot. It's a very big operation um, and I'd say for most people it's a last resort because all the potential side effects but it can be quite effective actually um, in some people so I would say if there's really nothing else to consider after all the other treatments then I think it would be reasonable to consider that but definitely definitely not as a first uh, operation. So let's talk about radiotherapy for Lederhose disease and again this evidence was um, gathered by Professor Siegenschmidt in Germany um, in 2012 and he treated 158 patients and followed them up for more than five years. And these are patients, all of whom, again, have progressed over the last six to 12 months, and they had increased nodules and cords um, and increasing symptoms. Most have been treated with conservative treatment, as I said before. And they were told about the various options. And they were told about conservative treatments, so orthotics, etc., radiotherapy and surgery. And after that um, talk, um, most of the patients chose radiotherapy. So more than 60% chose radiotherapy. And the other was form a control group. And I'll say again, this is a non-randomized control group. And therefore, um, this is not a randomized controlled study. And I think this is one of the reasons why presently this doesn't tend to be funded by a lot of public health systems in a widespread basis. And here's results you can see on the left. So symptoms improved in 79% with radiotherapy and in 19% with the control. So a few messages here. Clearly, radiotherapy improves symptoms in most people and much better the than those who didn't have radiotherapy. But interestingly, actually, 19% did actually improve by themselves without radiotherapy. So there's a small chance that without treatment they might improve, but of course, much greater chance that it won't improve without treatment. Um, and that's... Um, effective radiotherapy was translated into less pain and walking um, and also improved walking. Now my results in my patients that I um, published a number of years ago um, when I treated around five, uh, 50 patients with Lederhose disease showed virtually exactly the same results. So 79 patients in, had improved overall and 20% of patients had not improved. Um, again, minor side effects in most patients. The side effects are virtually identical to those with uh, Dupuytren's disease. And in summary, radiotherapy is a very effective and safe treatment for those uh, patients with Lederhose disease who have symptoms. So I thought it might be helpful just to go through a case study um, of someone who had both these conditions and just to go through some of the thinking that I went through and how to treat this particular patient. So this was a 45 year old man. He previously had Pironi's disease. So in other words, a plaque in the penis that caused problems there. His father had had advanced Dupuytren's disease. So he had a family history. 15 years ago, so when he was 30, he developed um, Garrod's pads. So the knuckle pads that were painful. Two years ago, he developed nodules in his left palm. And six months ago, he had further nodules in his left palm his fingers became tighter, and he also developed nodules in his right hand. I will say these are not photos of this patient. On examination, as I say, he had Garrod's pads. In his left hand, he had nodules, cords, skin retraction, all the things you would expect to see with Dupuytren's disease. And he also had, had loss of hyperextension of his ring and little fingers, so he was not able to get them past the midline. So he couldn't do this, they stayed on the midline. But he did not have a contracture. In his right hand, he had nodules, had cords, but no loss of hyperextension. So it was a little milder on his right hand. On his left foot, he had two nodules um, and they were tender. So what was I considering when I saw this patient? So I was thinking, well, what's the likelihood of progression to contracture with no treatment? So would no treatment be a good option for him? Um, if he did get a contracture, what would be the success of surgical release? So again, you know, is it better just to let him um, get a contractor and then send him to a surgeon if that was going to be very, very effective? Is there a treatment for Garrod's pads? What should I do about the leather hose disease, the nodules on his feet? 
and are there any treatment, other treatments available? So this were my answers to these questions. So it's important that I tell my patients that this disease has a variable course. In other words, some people do not get worse, and do not get a contracture. However, this gentleman, he was male, um, had a young onset, he had it in both hands, but that's by what bilateral means. Ectopic means he also had it in places outside of his hands, so the, the peroneus disease and also the, in the feet, and he had a family history. So all of those factors um, make him have what we call a Dupuytren's diathesis, which makes it, first of all, more likely he'll get the disease, but also more likely that it will get worse over time. So although I have to say it has a variable course, I think in his case, it felt to me like it was very, very likely to get worse. What's the success of surgical release? Well, a fasciectomy, which is the open surgery, has about a 40 to 50% recurrence rate. And, you know, it's a pretty large operation and maybe you're out of action with that hand for six to eight weeks. Um, having a needle is a less invasive option, but has a higher recurrence rate. Um, so up to an 80% recurrence rate. So for a lot of patients, if you do leave them to get a contracture, it may well come back. And then ultimately you've lost the chance of giving radiotherapy, although there are some patients that we can give radiotherapy after surgery. What do we do about the knuckle pads, the Garrod's pads? Well, they tend to come back after a section. So um, you can treat them with radiotherapy and that can be quite effective in, in quite a lot of cases, I would say in my experience, about 70% of people. Um, for lederhose disease, you can, of course, um, uh, do surgery, but that can be disastrous. As I said before, it tends to come back. And is there any other treatment available? Well, of course, I would offer to him radiotherapy to all those um, parts of him. So in summary, the role of radiotherapy for Dupuytren's disease is for early disease, which is progressing, in other words, getting worse, for people with straight fingers or nearly straight fingers. Um, it reduces the risk of contracture by about three times. It can also be used to treat painful nodules and also can be used to uh, reduce the risk of recurrence after surgery. For patients with Lederhose disease, nodules on their feet, I tend to use it for people who have some discomfort or pain associated with the nodules or where the nodules are growing. I don't tend to use them for people who have nodules that are not growing and do not have pain. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, we do have a few questions that our members have put together for me before this talk. Do you want us to go through them now or? Absolutely. Delighted. Right, let me... I'll just have to find them. Did that pretty well cover a lot of what you wanted, Anna? You did. Good. You might have disagreed with some of the things, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, you know, there were some things I didn't go into just because of too much detail. Like, I didn't go into using radiotherapy after surgery. I didn't go into current trials. You know, there's lots of stuff I could have talked about. Yeah, but we also don't want to overdo it. Exactly, exactly. That's what I thought. So I think I will say, let's just touch on some of the questions. For instance, a lot of patients talk about treatment failure. Would you say if a patient, if the disease is sent into regression and then maybe two or three years later it flares up again, is that treatment failure or is it just natural progression of the disease that unfortunately can't be stopped completely with radiotherapy? I think that's a really good question and I suspect that the answer is sometimes one and sometimes the other. So um, for some patients they do truly have disease that um, might or might not respond well to radiotherapy in the first place and then gets worse. So I think there are some patients who do fail radiotherapy. Um, and for some people, the disease just continues to get worse and continues to grow through, through the radiotherapy. So I would term that primary radiation failure. 
Uh, there are some patients who um, the same disease, so the same nodule, responds well, and then a couple of years later starts growing again. And I would say that's a secondary radiation failure. So in other words, it responded well and then secondarily gets worse. I think though there are some patients who have disease that I treat which responds well, and then many years down the line have new disease that forms that was never treated with radiotherapy in the first place. So I think you know that isn't necessarily a radiation failure, although that's arguable. I think also there's a fourth group of patients where you treat part of the hand and that disease responds well and then there's another part of the hand where there's a new nodule and obviously that's not radiation failure it's just that disease starts in an area which wasn't previously treated by radiotherapy. Now all of those patients are I would consider differently in terms of what you do from there. Those patients who, were, who have disease that wasn't previously treated by radiotherapy, either on a different part of the hand or foot or a different hand or foot, so in other words, treated the left and it comes back on the right, I would just treat them with radiotherapy in the normal way. So in other words, two weeks of treatment, standard way. If they have primary radiotherapy failure, in other words, it just never responded, then I just think radiotherapy is not really the right thing for them, in my view. If, however, they had a good response to radiotherapy and then at least a year down the line it comes back in the same area, then I do consider retreating those patients. But instead of using the two weeks of treatment, I'm very cautious and I only use one week of treatment. I have found that some patients have had a response to that um, and I think it's worth trying, but what I would say is there is not really any evidence out there in the literature showing that it works. So this is somewhat anecdotal. Um, but the reason why I use just one week of treatment is because I think the likelihood of it causing major side effects is also very low. So it's a little unclear what there is to gain, but I think I'm still saying, staying within a fairly safe um, margin in terms of how much radiotherapy I'm giving. So I feel a little uneasy about people who, who would um, repeat the same dose of radiation. I think, you know, my worry is that patients will get side effects, for instance, with scarring and so on. But I feel comfortable giving half the dose the second time. Great. Another question we get asked a lot is, is there any kind of condition patients might have that stops them having radiation, like for instance arthritis, fibromyalgia, anything that, that you would say, well, no, I don't even need to examine this patient because I know I'm not going to offer you radiation. So there are certain very rare specific syndromes um, where you actually can't use radiation. So certain connective tissue disorders, um, but particularly um, things like ataxia, ataxia telangiectasia, um, where people are so sensitive to radiation that it can cause damage and that's something that all oncologists are very aware about and if patients have it again I'm sure they will be aware of that. But what I would say is normal conditions like arthritis, diabetes, um, you know fibromyalgia, you know I don't really think there's any particular reason why you shouldn't have radiation in those cases in fact, many years ago, radiation was actually used as a treatment for arthritis. And in fact, in, in various places in the continent, um, people who have bad osteoarthritis, who would prefer to not have surgery, actually are treated with a very low dose of radiation. So my feeling is that radiation is not an issue with osteo or osteoarthritis. Um, and so in terms of local other conditions, the only thing, the other thing I would say is if people have got open wounds, then I would be cautious because radiation can reduce wound healing. Um, so for instance, patients who have surgery, I would tend to wait till the wounds are healed until I give radiation after that. Right. But something like Raynaud's disease, you wouldn't worry too much? No, I, Raynaud's is not a contraindication to radiotherapy. Thank you. How about fibrosis after radiotherapy? Would you worry about that? Do you tend to see that or not in the doses you use for the patients? So fibrosis is, um, is a sort of medical word for scarring. 
Um, and when we use very, very high doses of radiation, for instance, when we treat people with breast cancer or for skin cancer, because we're using such high doses, there is a small risk that we cause fibrosis or scarring. Now, um, in the doses that we use for Dupuytren's disease, um, we don't see that. Um, so the chance of getting scarring as a result of radiotherapy is very, very low. I mean, I would never say never, but certainly not something I've seen. Another question uh, connected to that is that people are worried if we give radiotherapy that the surgeons can't do surgery as a result. Um, and they worry that, for, that, first of all, wound healing would be worse. There's no evidence that that's the case. And also that if we cause scarring, that surgeons will find it more difficult to do their surgery. In fact, there are some surgeons that say that radiotherapy, because it actually reduces the scarring, in other words, reduces the amount of dupatrons, can actually make it easier. I mean, I've heard surgeons say both ways. Some are just worried. Um, they don't have any evidence for that worry, but they're just anxious that their surgery will go well. I think it's a reasonable worry, but I'm not sure that there's necessarily any evidence for that worry. Um, so what I would say is, if you find that your surgeon says that they don't want to do surgery because you've had radiotherapy, then there are other surgeons that will fill that gap. And there are plenty of surgeons that will definitely consider either a needle or full fasciectomy if you've had radiotherapy before. Good. You mentioned moisturising your hands. Is it important for patients to only use a moisturiser after the radiation treatment and not, say, an hour before? Um, you know, it's reasonable to use moisturiser during and after the radiotherapy treatment. It's probably not necessary during the radiotherapy treatment unless you already have very dry hands. But you need to be really careful what sort of moisturiser you use. Some of them have um, substances in there that can actually irritate the skin. So for instance, uh, things that have perfume in, um, they can irritate the skin during the radiation. And obviously you can get worse side effects, so you need to avoid those. Some of them also have things that can actually increase the radiation dose to the skin. They can have various sort of metals in them. Um, and clearly those are ones that you must avoid. So what I would say is talk to your radiation therapist generally the people who work the machine, or the radiation oncologist, if you're going to use a moisturiser, show them which one you're using and ask before you use it during the radiotherapy. I would say after the radiotherapy, we're a little more relaxed about it, but during the radiotherapy, you need to be very careful. So, for instance, people who use magnesium oil, which is quite popular at the moment to try and prevent contractures, that wouldn't be a good idea. Definitely not. Mustn't use magnesium oil during radiotherapy. Right. How about food supplements, curcumin? And I, think, I think it's important to say that, um, you know, whilst I'm not against using supplements in general terms, there is no evidence that these um, are helpful. And what I mean by evidence is not, you know, that one patient or 10 patients find it helpful. It's really people who are trying these out in a controlled way, in other words, in sort of experimental clinical trials, making sure that first of all, they are effective, and second of all, that they're not harmful, because sometimes actually supplements can do more harm than good. I would say that um, in terms of using them during radiotherapy, again, please do not use them, because they can potentially interfere with the radiation effect either making the side effects worse or make, making the radiotherapy less effective. So during the radiotherapy, it's important you do not use these supplements. Great, I think we've covered all the questions there. Fantastic, so, I, thought, I thought there were going to be, I thought there were going to be hundreds. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Good, okay. Um, 